Thanks very much, Christine. Well, hi everyone. It is fantastic to be here with you tonight uh, because I lead a team at Nature Glenelg Trust working hard to implement ecological restoration projects across southeastern Australia. To do this topic justice, the first thing we need to do is go back in time and use our detective skills. That is because the term ecological restoration explains that we are trying to put back something that we have lost, which means we need to be confident about what it was like in the first place. If we don't understand this, we run the risk of not seeing the bigger picture or pursuing the entirely wrong vision. By referring to the earliest descriptions of Australia's East, Australian ecosystems, we can build a picture of what the landscape looked like when Europeans first arrived. However, we are still just coming to appreciate why the landscape looked as it did. And this means understanding ecological processes or drivers, the interactions between the elements in our ecosystems. In 1788, it is now clear that large parts of Australia were actively managed by traditional owners and that many of our ecosystems functioned in a completely different way with Aboriginal people driving, guiding or influencing a number of those processes. They were also at the top of the food web, along with the recently arrived dingo on the mainland and the thylacine and devil in Tasmania, after being not long lost from the mainland themselves. Yet tragically, much of southeastern Australia underwent enormous changes, starting at the top of this web before Europeans had even set foot upon most of it. This is because uh, of disease, small, smallpox to be specific, which was first introduced by Europeans in Sydney Cove in 1789. Over the next few decades, waves of smallpox and other diseases brought by Europeans decimated Aboriginal populations across southeastern Australia. Ironically, this occurred long before most of those communities had even seen a white person or experienced the frontier violence that followed. And its silent impact greatly obscured or distorted the views of the Europeans who followed in its wake. With the subsequent arrival of sheep en masse came coordinated efforts by graziers to protect them from predators. The dingo on the mainland and the thylacine in Tasmania were the first targets. The loss of these, these apex mammal predators, cascading changes began to trickle through the ecosystem. Changes that were hastened and accelerated by the introduction of European mammals, such as foxes, cats and rabbits. Numbers of some species, like kangaroos, increased, while populations of others, like many small to medium sized native mammals, such as quolls and others between the size of bandicoots and small, small wallabies, rapidly collapsed towards extinction. This trend was repeated everywhere except Tasmania, where devils appear to have played a critical protective role. Many of these species, like betongs, were our soil engineers, digging and foraging to keep the ground healthy in symbiotic relationships with plants, fungi and other species. The millions of sheep by then in Australia, which were overstocked in many areas and prior to modern farming methods, changed native vegetation composition and structure compacted and expo exposed the soil and led to erosion of our waterways on an enormous scale. If you come back to review the recording of this talk, then please pause this slide and have a read of the first hand detailed description of the early transformation that occurred uh, to the land in Western Victoria. And this is representative of what happened in other parts of Australia as well. The very nature of our waterways and valleys was altered as chains of ponds and permanent waterholes were replaced by deeply eroded drainage lines. It is hard to believe, but much of this change was cemented by the mid 1800s, a time when clearance of land and artificial drainage of wetlands had barely begun. In fact, these activities would not emerge on a large scale until the early to mid 1900s and accelerating rapidly after World War II. Bushland was further fragmented and connectivity was lost, placing our remaining species under even more pressure as they faced risks of inbreeding due to isolation and small population size. The point of explaining this history is to highlight that Southern Australia has been so fundamentally altered for so long that no one alive today remembers the way it truly was. This is an uncomfortable history, but it is a story that we need to face up to and to understand, to focus our efforts in ecological restoration. I firmly believe that a lack of memory and connection with our own recent past is holding us back from doing some of the things we could be trying next. But fortunately, many of the clues are out there if you know where to look. Tonight's seminar is part of that process of sharing knowledge and exploring solutions. The decade ahead is our chance to be part of the turning point, upscaling our efforts, looking beyond simply protecting the fragments that remain, being brave enough to reach out to traditional owners and creative enough to exper experiment with new self-sustaining ideas to bring our continent back to life. Thankfully across Australia, every one of the ecological themes I've mentioned here is being investigated 
and includes cultural burning to improve land condition and promote natural regeneration, re-engineering waterways to repair floodplains, returning missing species to fill vital e ecological niches like apex predators, predator guilds or soil engineers, and revegetation and corridors to link fragmented bushland. However, given these uh, topics probably require a two-hour seminar each to do them justice, I'm going to just briefly explore one additional theme, and that is wetland restoration, which has been a major focus for NGT over the past decade. For those of you listening who are not familiar with our rural landscapes, it may surprise you to learn that despite being the driest inhabited continent on Earth, artificial drainage of wetlands is commonplace across all agricultural regions of Australia. It can vary from minor cuttings through embankments to drain a single wetland through to more comprehensive drainage networks that remove water across entire properties that were prone to inundation. In the case of NGT's property at Walker Swamp, we had to contend with backfilling 26 kilometres of constructed drains across the landscape. Removing the water from land in southern Australia has allowed the establishment of introduced pastures for grazing and totally disrupted the natural cycles of wetland species. In many cases, this change took place decades ago and you could be forgiven for thinking that all was lost. However, as we have now demonstrated at a wide range of sites, wetlands are especially resilient ecosystems and water is an incredibly powerful restoration tool for triggering ecological recovery. As long as the water is still available, then once it is held back on the land for long enough, this artificial drought can be broken, and that is when the magic truly begins. This ecological process commences as the re-inundated soil quickly flips from an aerobic to anaerobic state. As long as the water lasts long enough, then over a period of a few months, the introduced species will gradually dry, die, sorry, and their seed in the soil will also be killed. In their wake, there is a lot of space and fresh opportunity for any residual native wetland plants and their seed bank to take advantage of the favourable conditions. Areas of open water quickly attract water birds, frogs and other animals, and they in turn can also reintroduce the seeds of other missing plant species carried on their feathers or scats. Over a few short years, sometimes faster, ecological complexity and a functioning ecosystem returns. And after now restoring dozens of natural wetlands since 2012, NGT are yet to encounter a site where active revegetation of the aquatic zone was even needed because of this spontaneous ecological process. As well as working with farmers across the agricultural landscape, we have also worked closely with public land managers to restore wetlands in nature reserves that were modified long before these areas were set aside for conservation, triggering positive transitions in native plant and animal communities. Beyond water, over time, we also hope to explore a wider range of novel restoration techniques on NGT's own reserves, because most of these sites have a long farming history and are therefore excellent places for safe experimentation with new ideas. Now, finally, despite the focus on water, I'm going to end with a cute photo. In case you're wondering, this is a purebred alpine dingo pup found in the highlands of northeast Victoria, and it's um, its discovery is being described as something of a miracle that has gained a lot of media attention over the past week. The reason it is considered a miracle is because we have, very, uh, we have a very confused relationship with this species in southern Australia, where dingoes and wild dogs are inadvertently lumped together and impacted by the same indiscriminate policies. To highlight the dilemma, the, the dingo is a threatened species in its own right in Victoria, but at the same time is also subject to poison baiting programs that are in place to control wild dogs. Yet this photo is also a story of hope because in the face of everything that has been thrown at dingoes, they still persist in a few places south of the dog fence. Uh, a multi-state barrier which has changed Australia's ecology at a continental scale. At the moment, we still have a chance to rethink our relationship with this important apex predator in appropriate areas of the mainland, an opportunity that is now lost to us for the thylacine. So despite over 200 years of battling nature and inadvertently or deliberately modifying, subduing and controlling natural processes, the main point of my talk is that we still have a chance to reverse that trend. Improved water, sorry, improved management of water, fire, apex predators and other missing key species or ingredients in our ecosystems can help us sustainably repair and recover our amazing continent. Elements of this same logic can also equally apply in some of our most damaged or modified environments, including urban areas. In summary, I'm a strong believer that sharing a positive vision and hope is a much more powerful motivator for community action 
than despair, anger, or fear. So to everyone listening tonight, our collective responsibility over the next decade is to normalise the topic of ecological restoration in our community, to do your bit to contribute to restoration projects, and by doing so, you'll be sharing a message of hope for the future. So thanks very much for listening. That's great. Thank you, Mark. And let's hope